we go. Good evening and welcome to the fastest half hour in the crypto world. This week at Bigfoot, the news show that scours the internet and the Bigfoot community to bring you the people, places, and stories making headlines around the Bigfoot world. Then we take it and wrap it up in a nice, neat 30-minute package. If it has to do with Sasquatch, Bigfoot, and the Wild Man, we've got it all covered. Here's what's been going on this week. Our DNA vacuums the future of sample collection. We'll look at how a university in Denmark just might provide the technology and know-how to break this Bigfoot case wide open. Mike Lucci takes a look at the life and research of Peter Byrne as the Bigfoot community says goodbye to the legend. Snowwalker's back with a brand new Two Minutes With, and it's UFO hearing time on Capitol Hill. These stories and a whole lot more, so you better buckle up, because we're going to hit it, and we're going to hit it hard. Let's go. Like a man. Well, we just don't want something crawling around out here. But the wind back up to melt. Get somebody out there. What's going on out there? That's all of a bitch is about six foot nine, I don't know. He's all black and big. DNA air sampling, also known as environmental DNA air sampling, is a groundbreaking scientific technique that collects and analyzes DNA present in airborne particles. This innovative approach provides valuable insight into species distribution, disease surveillance, and biodiversity. The process involves using specially designed air filters to collect airborne particles containing DNA from the environment. These filters then trap DNA-carrying particulates, which are then extracted and purified in a laboratory setting. A group of researchers from the University of Copenhagen recently led an expedition into the Danish forest. Their mission to test this groundbreaking technique. Til det der har vi udviklet en, skal vi kalde det en støvsuger, som vi simpelthen når vi tænder den, så kan vi suge luft ind over et filter. Og på det her filter fanger vi så dyrs DNA. Armed with plastic boxes equipped with the DNA air samplers, the group sought to collect animal DNA from the air itself in the environment in the forest. This process involves strapping the units to a tree, much like you do with a trail camera. Then, over the next three days, the team returned to collect and replace the air filters, while monitoring the environment for the presence of any wildlife. Now, it's worth noting that during the collection process, except for the sound of woodpeckers in the distance, the team encountered absolutely no wildlife whatsoever. They saw nothing. Once the collection process was complete, researchers then began to replicate the collected DNA sequences, using a technique called polymer's chain reaction. This replication process aids in the detection and analysis of the genetic material. The DNA is then sequenced to identify the species present in the samples. By sequencing the airborne DNA particulates collected in the filters, the team made a remarkable discovery. In an area roughly the size of a football field, they detected DNA traces from over 60 animal species. The results included what you might expect, domestic animals like cows, horses, pigs, sheep, and chickens, and even exotic pets like parakeets and peacocks. However, the real surprise came with the detection of an additional 50 wild animals. Among the wild animal DNA detected were species such as red deer, roe deer, Eurasian badger, white-tailed eagle, red fox, Eurasian red squirrel, common toad, smooth newt, great crested newt, crane, great spotted woodpecker, gray heron, marsh tit, woodcock, and many, many more. Amazingly enough, the researchers were able to identify nearly a quarter of all the land-living animals previously recorded in and around that area, and in only 72 hours. The researchers were meticulous in verifying their findings, ensuring the accuracy of the results. Even when they detected DNA from peacocks, which seemed highly strange for the Danish forest, they confirmed occasional sightings of these birds by local residents during their walks in the forests. This study clearly shows that this method could be an effective means of mapping the presence of wild animals in the forests of North America as well. This pioneering approach of vacuuming DNA from the air also has immense potential in answering the Bigfoot question. In fact, after reading the article on Earth.com, which I found posted in the Coalition for Critical Thinking's Facebook group, I reached out to the University of Copenhagen's Kristen Bowman to coordinate a possible collaboration with her team later this fall. While DNA air samplings does show immense promise, it also comes with certain limitations. Issues like potential contamination, uneven distribution of airborne DNA, and the need for comprehensive reference databases for accurate species identification poses challenges. 
Nevertheless, ongoing research continues to refine the technique and expand its potential applications. Monitor. But if you look for a giraffe in an open savanna, that's fairly easy. But if you look for something like a tapir like this, not in a, in a pen like this, but in dense rainforest, it's immensely difficult. If this works in a greater scale, it'll revolutionize the way we look at rainforest animals. The collaboration of us here at the show, the researchers from the Globe Institute, and possibly Darby York at Steven, North Carolina, could potentially bring us one giant step closer to solving the Bigfoot question. After all, these vacuum units were able to collect an immense amount of DNA in a very short period of time, and from a wide variety of animals that were nowhere near the collection units themselves. So, if Bigfoot is flesh and blood, as many claim, and it's wandering the forests of upstate New York or Pennsylvania, our team's collection units should be able to detect something of value for the project. Our plans would include placing the units in selected Bigfoot hotspots in upstate New York and Pennsylvania over an extended period of time and at various locations in order to increase the probability of gathering a wide variety of DNA samples. We would then carefully collect and catalog the filters, send them to Bowman's team in Denmark, fly to send them to Darby's team in North Carolina, or possibly submit them to the University of Massachusetts Amherst and Todd Disotel's lab. We should be able to identify not only most of the living creatures in the area, but a constant unknown sample as well. At least you'd think, if Bigfoot does indeed inhabit or travel through these areas, as many of you claim. So, we'll see what happens, we'll keep our fingers crossed, and of course, we will continue to keep you posted on the progress. Exciting times lie ahead here, folks, when science and curiosity collide to hopefully unravel the mystery we call Bigfoot. Descriptions of squatches generally describe the same thing, a tall, hairy humanoid. But the more of them you hear, it slowly becomes apparent that they come in different appearances. Scientifically speaking, these distinctions are a result of physical adaptations caused by factors like regional isolation and habitat. This was something Dr. Jeff Meldrum even discussed at the 2017 International Bigfoot Conference. Well, my, my impression from the evidence that I've seen, primarily based on the footprint evidence, is that there, uh, there's not justification for more than one species. Uh, just as any animal that has a wide distribution and particularly one that has a, probably has a very fragmented population where there's um, restriction in gene flow, then you may get pockets of, of specialized adaptation in various areas. And so, uh, you know, just like with black bear, a black bear in Northern California looks very different than a black bear in, in the right. southeastern United States right? Uh, or versus a black bear in, in Alaska. So I think those same kinds of uh, ecological adaptations and... Um, uh, restricted gene pool might, might reflect in. Some researchers use these distinctions to classify Bigfoot into different types based on their physical characteristics. While some list up to 10 different ones, most of the info I found only describe four main types. Now, before we dive in, I should clarify that I'm only doing this based on North American sightings. This isn't an endorsement of Bigfoot's existence and solely based on whatever information I could find. The first one we have here is Patty, your type 1 Bigfoot. The largest of these four main types, Patty essentially describes your quintessential squatch, i.e. what the majority of people would expect one to look like. They are completely covered in hair, have a deep set of eyes, a prominent sagittal crest, and resemble something between a human and mountain gorilla. They are considered the friendliest but shyest of all four types and are typically found in upper parts of North America. Type 2 squatches are called wood boogers. They are commonly reported in the southern United States, primarily in the Deep South. They are generally said to be smaller than type 1s but have a slighter build and appear more chimp-like. They are also bolder and said to be more aggressive than type 1s. Some believe they may even have three to four toes, so a few classic type two examples would be the falcon, honey island swamp monsters, arguably maybe even the skunk ape. Now, this isn't the case everywhere, but most of the stuff I read refers to type three squatches as gugwies. They're apparently a much rarer Bigfoot type, but are reportedly the most dangerous to encounter. I saw one video that said Type 3s mainly preside along the Missouri River Basin spilling into Canada. 
They reportedly look like type 1 squatches, but have more of a protruding snout. Uh, some descriptions even give them fangs. Gugus look more mandrill or baboon-like, and have even drawn comparisons to dogmen for their similar appearance and ferocity. Type 3 are allegedly even more aquatic, with some descriptions claiming they could even have webbed feet. One notable Type 3 example I found was something called the Beast of Seven Shoots. The most common name for Type 4 squatches I encountered were Relic Hominids. They're said to be within the same height range as Type 1s, but are less hairier and have more human Neanderthal-like faces. Type 4s are most commonly seen in the East and Northeast United States. They are supposedly the smartest of all four main types, but won't shy away from exhibiting aggression. Some even think Type 4s could actually just be Type 1s, but with less hair. I guess some good Type 4 examples might include what the late Claudia Ackley saw in 2016, which she described as having a Neanderthal-like appearance, and based on descriptions, possibly something like the Tennessee Wildman. To reiterate, anything about these Bigfoot types is pretty much based on first and second hand descriptions. We added a few links and videos about this segment in the description if you want to learn more. So let us know if you think we got it right or if you think we left any out. And yeah, if you think you saw one, let us know which of these types you think it might have been. Today's episode of This Week in Bigfoot is sponsored by Gut Knockers Apparel and Clothing. From hoodies and caps to soaps, keychains, and bats, Gut Knockers has everything you need to show your love of Bigfoot. For more information and to shop their items, be sure to visit the Gut Knockers page on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Gut Knockers. Hey, Gut Knockers? Now, we've been down this road before, and I'm fully aware that most of you tuning in would prefer that we stay in our own lane and stick to the topic of Bigfoot. And that's fair. I mean, after all, the show is called This Week in Bigfoot. But recently, the world's attention has slowly been drawn into our government's involvement with unidentified aerial phenomena, UAPs. And unless you've been living under a rock, last week's congressional oversight hearing on the subject aimed to shed light on these strange occurrences and assess our government's involvement possible cover-up, and lack of response. And so now it seems the floodgates have opened and the response from leading lawmakers on UFOs is about as direct as it could be. We're going to start talking to people. We're going to start naming names. So in a quick shift of lanes tonight, we'll take a look at the takeaways from this groundbreaking hearing, examine the challenges faced by the Congressional Committee, and the role the industrial complex plays in the investigations. And as we dig deeper, we'll see how this story might also shed light on the government's alleged cover-up of other strange phenomena. Think Bigfoot. Last Wednesday in Washington, D.C., the spotlight fell on three witnesses who shared their first-hand encounters with UAPs. The significance of this hearing lies in the fact that all witnesses testified under oath, squared. exposing for themselves to the risk of imprisonment truth, for making any false or misleading truth. statements. So help you guide. Their testimonies, though not providing physical evidence, gained credibility through this legal context. David Grush, who many consider the star witness, made waves with his allegations of secret government programs for retrieving craft of non-human origin. As a result of your previous government work, have you met with people with direct knowledge or have direct knowledge yourself of non-human origin craft? Yes, I personally interviewed those. If you believe we have crashed craft, uh, stated earlier, do we have the bodies of the pilots who piloted this craft? As I've stated publicly already in my News Nation interview, uh, biologics came with some of these recoveries. Yeah. Former Navy pilot Ryan Graves added another layer of intrigue to the proceedings, recounting his observation of a massive UAP hovering over a military installation in 2003. Uh, in the 2003 time frame, uh, a large group of Boeing contractors were operating near one of the launch facilities at Vandenberg Air Force Base when they observed a very large 100-yard sided uh, red square uh, approach the base from the ocean and hover at low altitude over one of the launch facilities. Um, this object remained for about 45 seconds or so before darting off over the mountains. Perhaps the most shocking revelation under oath was Grush's claim that individuals involved in UAP investigations have been threatened or harmed by the U.S. government. Real life men in black. Um, have you faced any retaliation or reprisals for 
any of your testimony or anything on these lines? Yeah, uh, I have to be careful what I say in detail because there is an open uh, whistleblower reprisal investigation on my behalf, and I don't want to compromise that investigation by, by providing anything that may uh, help provide somebody <laughs> information. But it was very brutal and uh, very unfortunate, some of the tactics they used to um, hurt me both professionally and, and personally, to be quite frank. Yeah. This alluded to an alleged cover-up of extraterrestrial technology raising unsettling questions about the hidden forces operating just beyond the public's view. And if that's not enough to get you wondering, the road to uncovering the truth here has been filled with nothing but obstacles for the Congressional Committee. Seriously, it's been ridiculous. Someone can reach through the veil of government and pierce it to the point of, we do not have access to something. you got to start asking yourself, who the hell's in control? We were denied access to the SCIF, and so, to my knowledge, what's going to happen now is not only do we have the support of the chairman, but um, they're going to get a nice letter from Congress, and as you heard, Representative Ogle said, if we're denied, we're going to use the Holman rule, we'll defund the position. From securing a suitable hearing room, one not under construction, being able to reserve a SCIF, a sensitive compartment information facility, that's where all the good shit gets told, away from the public eye, to obtaining access to sensitive information, such as witnesses, radar and flight data logs, and classified documents. Florida Congressman Matt Gates gives an example of one such instance. Several months ago, my office received a protected disclosure from Eglin Air Force Base indicating that there was a UAP incident that required my attention. I sought a briefing regarding that episode and brought with me Congressman Burchett and Congresswoman Luna. We asked to see any of the evidence that had been taken by flight crew in this endeavor and to observe any radar signature uh, as long as to, as well as to meet with the flight crew we were not afforded access to all of the flight crew and initially we were not afforded access to images and to radar thereafter we had a bit of a discussion about how authorities flow in the united states of america and we did see the image and we did meet with one member of the flight crew who took the image. The image was of something that uh, I am not able to attach to any human capability, either from the United States or from any of our adversaries. And I'm somewhat informed on the matter, having served on the Armed Services Committee for seven years, having served on the committee that oversees DARPA and advanced technologies for several years. Um, when we spoke with the flight crew, and when he showed us the photo that he'd taken, I asked why the video wasn't engaged, why we didn't have a FLIR system that worked. Here's what he said. They were out on a test mission that day over the Gulf of Mexico. And when you're on a test mission, you're supposed to have clear airspace, not supposed to be anything that shows up. And they saw a sequence of four craft in a clear diamond formation for which there is uh, a radar sequence that I and I alone have observed in the United States Congress. One of the pilots goes to check out that diamond formation and sees a large floating, what I can only describe as an orb, again, like I said, not of any human capability that I'm, that I'm aware of. The U.S. industrial complex is essentially a network of interconnected relationships and interests that influence defense policy, military spending, and the production of military equipment and technology. You know, toys for war. And while their collaboration can yield amazing benefits such as UAV drones, stealth technology, and directed energy weapons, just to name a few, the close relationship between the military and the defense industry can lead to inflated defense budgets and the spending on unnecessary or ineffective weapon systems. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists. It can also lead to funding black programs such as reverse engineering UAP or alien technology. Think Area 51. These congressional oversight hearings are essential in addressing the public's growing interest and concerns surrounding the UAP phenomenon. As lawmakers strive to strike the balance between national security and the public's right to know, establishing transparent protocols for accessing classified data becomes paramount. There's nothing that you're aware of that's above special access program classification. It, it's a misnomer that there's anything actually above top secret. Executive Order 13526 delineates the classification levels. Right. And, but I, I, I draw a point on that because we can have access to, mm -hmm. to those programs. And so the notion that 
we're not being given that access sort of defies our typical muscle memory here in Congress. Thank you, Mr. Burchett. I'll yield back to you. As we contemplate the challenges and potential cover-ups in these UAP investigations, it raises intriguing connections to other unexplained phenomena, such as Bigfoot. Could there be parallel narratives of government secrecy and elusive truths surrounding the existence of cryptids like Bigfoot? While the evidence may remain elusive, it calls for a broader conversation about the potential for unaccountable forces shaping our understanding of the unexplained. The recent congressional oversight hearings offered a glimpse into the enigma that surrounds mysterious phenomena. The challenges faced by the committee and the influence of the industrial complex have ignited debates about government oversight and accountability and the public's right to know. As we continue to explore the unknown, we must also consider the implications of this UAP investigation and hearing on other unexplained phenomena like Bigfoot. Only through open dialogue, transparent protocols, and unwavering commitment to truth can we hope to unravel this perplexing mystery. Are you ready to uncover the mysteries of Bigfoot? Join us for Squatch Con Idaho 2023. This year, we're bringing the magic directly to your screen or join us in person. Witness the world premiere of the enhanced Paul Freeman Bigfoot footage. Doug Highcheck discovered a secret within this enhanced video you'll have to see to believe. Hear from an all-star panel of Bigfoot experts like Dr. Jeffrey Meldrum, Cliff Barockman, Brian King Sharp, and Michael Freeman. Get exclusive online bonuses such as Bigfoot-themed wallpapers, a Bigfoot coloring book, an interactive Bigfoot quiz, a Squatch Nut Field Guide, get a copy of the Freeman Bigfoot Files ebook, and more. Whether you attend in person or watch it live online, you'll be part of an unforgettable experience. Don't miss out on this unique opportunity. Secure your spot today. Squatch Con Idaho 2023. Step into the unknown. All right, folks, you should know by now, look at the clock on the wall, and you can tell it's the part of the show where we give content creator Michael Merchant, a.k.a. Snow Walker Prime, screen time to speak his mind and get what's ever bothering him off his chest. Now, I'm pleased to report the return of Snow Walker to the show. He's been chomping at a bit to get back at it, so without further delay, here he is now, back from Central America. This is Two Minutes With. Brendan says we need new material. It's Brendan with an E. Brendan, agree to disagree. There's no disagreeing. That's his name. I thought we came here to talk about Sasquatch and Bigfoot. That's all you ever talk about. You are not going to believe the evidence I have for you. No, you're right. I probably won't believe it. It is incredible. Have you seen this Bigfoot hand? A Bigfoot hand. That's right, Bigfoot hand. It was found in a Montana dump and was given to the police department. They thought they suspected foul play. So you mean it was a human hand? No, 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 no. It's not a human hand. It's a Bigfoot hand. What makes you think this is a Bigfoot hand? I mean, what else can it be? Let me finish my story. So the police eventually gave it back to the Bigfoot researcher. They gave the human hand back to the Bigfoot researcher. That's right, and it's been preserved in isoprophic alcohol. Wouldn't the fact that the police gave this hand back pretty much eliminate the possibility it was human? It's not human. It's Sasquatch, I'm telling you. You know, there's a lot of bears in Montana. <laughs> Huh? Huh? <laughs> so? So, what's your point? My point is, it's likely to be a bear hand. No, no, it's a Bigfoot hand. How many times I gotta tell you? It's a Bigfoot hand, it's amazing. Have you noticed that it's missing the distal phalanges? You and your big words, Mr. Smarty Pants, Mr. I know it all, Mr. It's a bear hand. Technically, it would be a bear paw. The distal phalanges is why it doesn't have any fingernails. Don't you wonder why it doesn't have fingernails or skin? Look, I don't know about all those details. I just know it's a Bigfoot hand and I am so excited to finally have proof of Sasquatch, a Bigfoot hand. This is like the hand that Jimmy Stewart smuggled the finger bone out of Tibet. Remember the, the Yeti hand? So that, I'm not going to talk to it. 
which was actually human. I don't know why I'm friends with you. You are so skeptical. I'm just being reasonable and sensible. Think about it. How did Bigfoot lose his hand in a dump, lose the distal phalanges, and have the hand scun? Mm. <laughs> Well, I uh -huh. don't really have an answer for that, but it's it looks like a Bigfoot hand. What exactly does a Bigfoot hand look like? Well, it looks a lot like a human hand, except it's a, it's a Sasquatch. Please, be reasonable. Just think about this for a minute. Look, I have thought about it, and this guy has his hand, and he says there's only three possibilities. It's either a human, a bear, or a Bigfoot. How did Bigfoot even get into the realm of possibilities? It's a bear paw. It's a scun bear paw. This is what taxidermists do. This is what happens when you give little men big guns. How would you know? Are you a taxidermist? Look, I don't have to be a taxidermist to understand that when you skin out a bear, the hide is the trophy. Skinning out the paw is delicate work. It's usually reserved for the taxidermist. They sever the hand at the wrist and they leave it intact and salt it down and then the taxidermist skins it out and frequently discards the leftover hand missing the distal phalanges in the town dump. You know, every time I talk to you, you get so angry. I really worry about your heart. You might have an aneurysm. If I had an aneurysm, it would be a blessing. I wouldn't have to engage in these conversations with you anymore. You know, it's really tough being friends with you. Tough being friends with me? With, oh my God. You know, you really should get some pills to calm down. Take, take something. Maybe a Benadryl. Has it ever occurred to you that Bigfoot's not a physical creature? I have moved on. Have you seen this photo out of Florida? Trail camera photo of a Sasquatch holding a baby Bigfoot. Oh, good Lord. <laughs> Uh. This is what happens when you give little men guns. Tonight's edition of This Week in Bigfoot is sponsored by Broken Branch Designs. From outerwear and clothing to home and garden decor, Broken Branch Designs has everything to do with Sasquatch. For more information, visit BrokenBranchDesignsLLC.com. Last week, a shirtless Ronnie LeBlanc announced to Expedition fans everywhere the news that the action-adventure show will be moving on up. From the limited confines of the UK-based Travel Channel's 9 p.m. Sunday time slot to the big leagues, Discovery's 8.30 p.m. Tuesday slot, starting August 29th. Season 4, Expedition Bigfoot, is premiering on Discovery Channel. We are super stoked. We can't believe this. We're so excited for everyone to see season four and to move and have the chance to move on up and go to Discovery Channel. We can't be more excited. On a somewhat related note, Myra Mayer will be the keynote speaker at the 2023 Chattanooga Zoo Banana Ball, September 23rd. During the event, guests will also enjoy a gourmet sit-down dinner, open bar, animal encounters, live animal art, and more. I'd like to be in an event with an open bar with Myra. Sounds like a good time. Hmm. Banana Ball is Chattanooga Zoo's largest fundraiser, with proceeds going to the $3.9 million Cape of Africa expansion. Construction on the project is scheduled to start later this year. Tickets for the event are $185 a person and can only be purchased at chatzoo.org. Season 4 of Expedition Bigfoot premieres Tuesday, August 29th, 8.30 p.m. on Discovery. Hey, this is Chuck Larson. You're watching the CARC channel on YouTube. Some say that death comes in threes, and that seems to be happening in the Bigfoot community with the recent passing of Peter Byrne at age 97. Over the last month, we've lost three prominent icons, starting with Claudia Ackley on July 3rd, Michael Green on July 17th, and now Peter Byrne on July 28th. Part of the proverbial four horsemen of Bigfoot, Mr. Byrne had been in pursuit of the elusive creature for over 60 years long before the infamous Patterson-Gimlin footage was captured. Born in Ireland, he served in the Royal Air Force during World War II, after which he worked in northern India. Mr. Byrne said he discovered his first Yeti print in Nepal in 1948 and went on a three-year expedition to track the creature in 1957. His research was sponsored by Texas oilman Tom Slick, who in 1960 convinced Byrne to head an expedition in northern California. Mr. Byrne founded the International Wildlife Conservation Society in 1968, Bigfoot Research Project in the 1990s, and also ran the Bigfoot Information Center in the 1970s. 
One of Byrne's claims to fame was sending possible DNA samples to the FBI for testing in 1976. Although he says the FBI never followed up with him, the agency released documents showing that attempts to reach Mr. Byrne had been made, but were unsuccessful. Among those recently released documents were the test results on Mr. Byrne's samples, which are reportedly determined to be deer hair. Byrne was also apparently convicted of fraud in 2013. He served no jail time, but was sentenced to three years probation in order to pay full restitution. A renowned author who appeared in multiple Bigfoot-related documentaries, Byrne was the last surviving member of the Four Horsemen, an exclusive circle that also featured John Green, Rene DeHinden, and Grover Krantz. So his passing undoubtedly marks the end of a foundational era in Bigfoot history. Nonetheless, Mr. Byrne's legacy will continue to live on as the search for Sasquatch gets carried on by the next and future generations of researchers. It's time once again to check in with Doug Hycheck and the Legend Meets Science 2 production. A lot of interesting things happen, you know, in the camp. Um, we've had many wood knocks. We've had tent approaches, tent slaps, tent poles broken by something outside the tent. We've had growls, screams. You know, we've heard quite a few things. But every time something has gone wrong, which is so indicative of my past, um, cameras go dead early, um, batteries have been out. So we're just finding the power is the big problem. If your tent is approached and something's slapping your tent twice in the night, but it sneaks in from behind where there's no cameras or the cameras are already dead, we don't get anything. So we have the human experience, but that's it. All right, it's time to catch up to speed on a couple of recent Bigfoot podcasts and live streams. First up, our drinking buddy, Pat Turner and Squatch Talk. In his latest live stream, Pat sits down with George's own Caucasian Sasquatch. Here are the two Southern boys talk Bigfoot in the Bulldog State. Check it out. I've heard about people talking about Bigfoot penises before, and they never go there. And I'm like, well, what did it look like? You know, well, I want to point they, out, um, yeah. and being a young boy from Georgia, this was the first uncircumcised penis I'd ever actually laid eyes on it, and ever. <laughs> like, ever. Right. Yeah. So. I, I believe that. It, sure. It left it, it left an impression beyond I just saw some dude. Um and I don't, like I said, I always called it the hobo in a fur coat story because if there's some dude living out there, I'm not using that section of swamp and I have no idea how he is, but have at it. He ain't bothering nobody out there. Why should anybody go bother him? I felt bad for bothering him myself. It obviously disappointed him. I saw the disappointment on his face. Next up, it's Greenwave 2010 FB. In this latest upload from our buddy MK Davis, the controversial researcher discusses everyone's favorite topic with him, and that's AI upscaling. Here, he tells how it may have just helped him once again prove that Patty is real. Let's listen in. And recently, uh, a Mr. Todd Gatewood from Oklahoma has uh, been assisting me with the film at using some of his skills uh, that he developed uh, that improve a good film, very, um, a good picture, very much. Let's look and see if this one... There's the raw image right here. Let's just take a look at it. There's a, a little, uh, what, are, what I consider to be a braid or possibly a dreadlock that's been, the wind has picked up and brought it up on the side of the head, exposing the ear, which is right here. Everything that's in this one right here is in this raw image. That ear is sitting right where the ear is supposed to be. The end of it, it ends in a braid, which is, uh, falling down over the cheek right here you can't really see it right here but that's where it's headed to the front of the face it exposes this ear the so people complain that they can't see an ear they complain way too much they don't know the film uh, they say that you can't see any any cleavage in the buttocks but you most certainly can
Now, if you follow the show, then you probably already know that we try and do our best to feature a new channel each and every week in this segment, Spread the Love. Sure, I have my favorites, but playing videos from a handful of channels I personally like wouldn't be fair and it would be biased. Currently, I'm subscribed to 378 YouTube channels, with well over 350 of them dedicated to the subject of Bigfoot. Research, research, research. The final video we're looking at this week will feature an interview with the good Dr. Jeffrey Meldrum, and it comes from a channel with only 444 subscribers. As of the filming of this segment, the video had a total of 125 views. An interview with Dr. Jeffrey Meldrum, 125 views. I've been trying to interview him for years. So, Dr. Meldrum, if you're watching, give me a call. Let's get you on the show. So until that day comes, here he is now on the J.D. Lionheart channel. Check it out. My personal opinion is there isn't good evidence that these creatures have um, extraordinary intelligence. And so, you know, I've had people from a religious perspective who, who say, well, you know, if you, if you show these creatures exist, then, you know, that bolsters evolution, that undercuts any kind of theologic explanation for human origins. And I said, you know, my response is, well, you know, does the existence of the gorilla threaten your faith? Does that, does that uh, lessen your, your uh, belief system because there's a creature that is remarkably similar to us anatomically? Well, no. And I said, well, in, in my opinion, these are just bipedal gorillas. They don't, uh, they don't threaten my position, my, my uh, self-esteem, if what it is to be human. As the calendar turns to August and heat continues to be a problem, Bigfoot conferences continue to draw in record crowds from coast to coast. That being said, there's still only one guy we can all turn to to keep us up to speed on the who's, the what's, and the where's, and that's Chuck Larson with another great show in this week's Spotlight. Paranormal Roundtable is Dogman and Cryptid Conference. September 2nd and 3rd, White Settlement, Texas. Conference Spotlight. Paranormal Roundtable's second annual Dogman Cryptid Festival is slated to start 9 a.m. Saturday, September 2nd and end 9 p.m. Sunday, September 3rd. The White Settlement Convention Center, located at 405 North Las Vegas Trail, White Settlement, Texas, is where the conference will be held. After selling out of last year's event, organizers Josh Turner and Ken Gerhardt believe that this year's event will be back bigger and better, with some of the biggest names in the paranormal and cryptid world speaking at this event. You can get tickets for this event at everbright.com. Tickets range from $65 to $125. A limited amount of VIP tickets are available. With the VIP ticket, you get an exclusive meet and greet catered dinner on September 1st, front row preferred seating the day of the event, and a paranormal roundtable swag bag filled with merch. So if you're in the Fort Worth, Texas area Labor Day weekend, Make it a point to get to this two-day festival. For more information, again, go to everbright.com or the festival Facebook page. And that's this week's Conference Spotlight. Brendan, back to you. All right, folks, once again, unfortunately, we are all out of time for this week's show. It flies by so fast, right? Look at that. Wow. Before we go, I'd like to thank you for watching and remind you to like and share everything we do here at the Catskill Appalachian Research Collective. It's very important for the growth of our channel and for the success of this show. And if you have any questions or comments, you want to let us know how we're doing, or maybe you have a story for the show, you can always drop us a line at This Week in Bigfoot Newscast at gmail.com. So, until next week, from Mike Lucci and Chuck Larson, I'm Brendan Brown, reminding you that when it comes to getting your Bigfoot news, be informed, not biased. Take care. <laughs>